In section 1.6, we want to dig a little deeper into the design of experiments. Now, we already learned about design experiments and observational studies, their counterparts, in section 1.2, but we want to dive deeper into the ways that we can design an experiment. Now, first, we have to be able to tell the difference between the two. So an observational study is when you measure the value of the response variable without attempting to influence the value of either the response or explanatory variables. So in an observational study, the researcher observes the behavior of individuals without trying to influence the outcome of the study. So surveys fall into that category, right? You're just observing behavior that already exists. You're not attempting to influence, right? That's important. Right. Whereas in a design experiment, it's a controlled study um, to determine the effect of varying in one or more explanatory variables, also known as factors, has on the response variables. So if I play with this explanatory variable on purpose, right, then what happens to that response variable? And any combination of the values of the factors is called a treatment. All right. Experimental units would be people or subjects that are um, in the experiment and to which the treatment is applied. So let's just make sure that we can tell the difference between these two for, um, before we can move on. So we want to explain whether the following is an observational study or a designed experiment. Researchers want to study the effect of a new treatment for high blood pressure. They gather 1,000 people with hypertension and place 500 randomly, or sorry, 500 randomly in a group to receive the new drug and 500 randomly in a group that will receive the old standard drug. After two months, the blood pressure of each person is measured and those on the new drug are found to have significantly low blood pressure than those on the standard drug. Oh, that's an experiment. Yes, <laughs> right? We all agree. So that's completely a designed experiment. The researchers are administering drugs, right? which is kind of a sign. All right. So the random assignment, they've randomly placed them into groups. So the researchers... randomly assign uh, the blood pressure drug. Right, that random assignment is key. All right. Now, what about the researchers want to study the effect of air pollution on lung capacity? They gather 500 people that live in highly polluted cities and measure their lung capacity. They then gather 500 people that live in low pollution rural areas and measure their lung capacity. It is found that the people in the low pollution areas have greater lung capacity. Okay, that is an observational study. They were just gathering people from where they already lived. They did not force the people to move there because that would be unethical. Yes. All right. So researchers cannot and did not randomly assign where people live. Because, of course, you can't. That would be unethical, right? You can't say to people, hey, I'm going to force you to live in a highly polluted area. That would be not good, right? So they cannot and did not assign where people live, and therefore it can't be a designed experiment. It has to be an observational study. Now, word of caution before we leave this page behind, which is that a control group doesn't necessarily mean that it's an experiment. And control gets a little confusing anyway. Um, when science people talk about control, what they're talking about is the group that you're controlling against, which is the placebo group, the group that gets nothing. So this is the group that receives no treatment. Or either no treatment or the placebo treatment or, oops, I was about to say placebo, no treatment placebo, or sometimes it's the standard treatment, which is what it was in this case, um, because it would be unethical to not give people the needed medication, right? They need some kind of medication, right? It was this one up here, right? So standard old uh, drug, that's the control group, if you will, because it would be unethical to take people with high blood pressure and give them nothing, right? That's going to lead to heart attacks. All right, so that control group 
does not necessarily mean that you have a, um, that your study is an experiment, however. So for example, if you have a researcher that compares the lung cancer rates and record records, so lung cancer rates and records of 150 non-smokers and 150 smokers. All right, so this is the control group right here. It's the no treatment group. Let me say it that way. This is not really a control group in, in the science definition of it. Um, Science-wise, control groups can only exist in experiments. However, observational studies have no treatment groups, which is what this is. But the existence of that no treatment group does not make it an experiment. It's still an observational study, regardless of having that no treatment group, right? So even though we have a group that didn't smoke, that doesn't matter, right? It's still an observational study because it would be unethical to force them to smoke or not smoke. And I just mentioned some definitions in there that are actually on the beginning of the next page. So let's move there. The placebo, which you probably have heard before, is the neutral treatment, has no effect or response on, on the response variable. So think a sugar pill, right? That's a placebo. It's not the only way you can do placebos. It's, they're not only the ones where you ingest them. A placebo effect is when subjects respond differently after they receive treatment, even if that treatment was a neutral treatment. Right. So people start feeling better just because they take the sugar pill because they were just going to, you know, psychologically boost themselves into feeling better. It happens. Now, the control group is a group that receives a baseline treatment that can be used to compare to other treatments. Now, you'll notice they're talking about treatments in here because they're assuming an experiment. Right. That's that's stuff that takes place in an experiment. So it gets the definitions a little confused. Um, control groups technically are only part of experiments, but again, neutral groups that are not part of an experiment are often talked about as if they're control groups. They're not, but having those neutral groups that receive no treatment or receive the baseline treatment does not make it an experiment. So control groups can be established in a wide variety of ways, no treatment, neutral treatment, placebo, standard treatment. So standard treatment, for example, on that previous example, when we had the blood pressure, because it would be unethical to give them nothing. And that kind of thing. Um, control group means the group that receives the baseline treatment. It does not mean they're controlled by the researcher. That That's a different definition, right? So that has to do with a different definition of the word control. So control in this scientific setting means baseline treatment. They're the group that you're comparing to. Now, blinding is a very important. Um, you'll often hear science teachers say that the best kind of study is one that is double blind, right, with placebos and all of that. Right, so a double blind experiment, well, let's first learn what a singleton blind experiment is. Blinding itself refers to the non-disclosure of the treatment an experimental unit is receiving. So they don't tell you what they're giving you. They're saying, here, take this pill, <laughs> right? And so if it's single blind, you don't know the experiment, um, experimental unit subject, right? This person that's the subject of the study does not know what they're taking. So they say, here, take this pill, you take that till, pill and you put it in your mouth. That's a single blind experiment. A double blind is that the person that's giving it to you doesn't know either, right? So the person that's taking the pill doesn't know and the person that's giving it doesn't know. Now you may be thinking, how is that ethical? Well, what they do is they, they number people. Somebody else does know, but it's not the person that interacts with the patient. So they'll say that person, you know, that patient's number 134, give them this pill. And so they will just give them that pill. They, they, but they don't get to know which one it was that way the researcher can't bias the results either. Because if the researcher knows, say in a single blind experiment, the patient doesn't know, the subject doesn't know, but the researcher or doctor knows. So they might bias the results by saying, you feel better, don't you? Mm -hmm. Right, that's biasing. So if you have double blind, then you can't bias those results. And so that's a good thing. So this is the gold standard. This is what all science and research wishes that it had. <laughs> right? So of, of experiments. It's got a control group, it's got double blinding, it's wonderful. The trouble is that it's very expensive, and it's not always possible. So it's costly, it's time consuming, and it's not always possible. Due to whatever reason, right? There are a lot of things that cannot be double blind experiments. It just has to do with ethics or the setup or what you're having people do, etc. As with all definitions, it'll be better if we can get an experiment or an example, in this case, an experiment, to show us how it was working. 
All right. Researchers conducted a double-blind placebo-controlled repeated measures experiment to compare the effectiveness of a commercial caffeinated carbohydrate electrolyte sports drink with a commercial non-caffeinated carbohydrate electrolyte sports drink. I'll say that 10 times fast. And a flavor-watered placebo. Okay. So they're giving them sports drinks, essentially. One with um, caffeine, one without caffeine, and one is just flavored water. 16 highly trained cyclists each completed three trials of prolonged cycling in a warm environment. That's what they say when they say repeated measures, because they're having them do it more than once. They did it once while receiving the placebo, one while receiving the non-caffeinated sports drink, and one while receiving the caffeinated sports drink. For a given trial, one beverage treatment was administered throughout a two-hour variable intensity cycling bout, followed by a 15-minute performance ride. Total work in kilojoules performed during the final 15 minutes was used to perform measure performance. So how did they perform in their last 15 minutes? So having them bike for two hours, right? Variable intensity. And then they're really having them, you know, bike real hard for those last 15 minutes. And those are the 15 minutes that they're measuring the amount of work. And that's the work that they do. That's science. That's kilojoules. It's a measured outcome. The beverage order for the individual subjects was randomly assigned, right? So they're trying to avoid bias. So they're randomly assigning that beverage order. A period of at least five days separated the trials. All trials took place at approximately the same time of day in an environmental chamber at 28.5 degrees Fahrenheit, or excuse me, degrees centigrade and 60 degree or 60% relative humidity with fan airflow of approximately 2.5 meters per second. The researchers found that cycling performance as assessed by the total work completed during the performance ride that last 15 minutes was 23% greater for the caffeinated sports drink than for the placebo and 15% greater for the caffeinated sports drink than the non-caffeinated sports drink. Cycling performances for the non-caffeinated sports drink and the placebo were not significantly different. The researchers concluded that the caffeinated carbohydrate electrolyte sports drink substantially enhanced the physical performance during prolonged exercise compared with the non-caffeinated carbohydrate electrolyte sports drink and the placebo. All right. So what does it mean for this experiment to be placebo controlled? See that right there? What does that mean? It meant that they had a placebo group. Right? That's what it means. So there was a placebo group, placebo group that was compared against, right? That's what control means in this case. It doesn't mean control like I control you, although you do because it's an experiment, but it's controlled as in there was a placebo group to control against. I'm sorry about that typo at the bottom of the page. That should be at the start of the next page. So I'll fix that for future. So to, for this group to, I mean, for this experiment to be placebo controlled, it means this experiment had a placebo group, which was the flavored water, to which the other treatments were compared, right? That served as a baseline. Um, to compare to for the other treatments. Right? So that placebo group, that flavored water group, that's your baseline. And you're basically comparing the other two groups to that placebo because the placebo is how those cyclers would perform anyway. And then we see, hey, does having these two types of sports drinks, does it make you perform significantly better? All right. What does it mean for the experiment to be double blind? Because it did mention right there that it's double blind. All right. What does that mean? Well, it means that the cyclers did not know what drink they were getting. And the person that was giving it to them did not know either. Now somebody knows, but it's not the people that are making that interaction, right? Which means the cyclers and the researchers that administering the drinks did not know which drink was being given. At any particular time. So they just say, here, drink this. <laughs> and they don't know what they're handing them and they don't know what they're drinking. But again, somebody knows. It's just not the people that are involved in that interaction. Now, why do you think it's necessary for the experiment to be double blind? Um, you want double blindness. So this is, you know, really part one right here. And part two, double blind is um, valuable because it helps you not bias your results. Right. 
because if you know what you're being given, then you might um, cycle harder or something that lasts 15 minutes because you know it's the caffeinated one. You want to give you know caffeine its shout out. So double blind is necessary to prevent bias by both the researcher and the cycler. Or cyclist, I should say. Cycler is probably not a word. <laughs> I should probably change this to cyclist. It, it is a little weird. Cyclists. Cycler feels like it should be a word. Now, how is randomization used in this experiment? Um, well, a variety of ways, right? Um, it, it was used to determine that order, right? So they mentioned that, let me go back here, um, a period of 55 days, all trials, where is it? The beverage order was randomly assigned. See it right there? So they're randomly assigning the beverage order right there. That's how randomness was used because they didn't randomly assign these people because these people were high performance cyclists. So they randomly assigned whether they were getting the placebo or whether they were getting the caffeine drink, right? So how was randomization used for the beverage order? All right, what is the population for which this study applies? Hmm. Well, you can make a couple arguments, right? Probably they're shooting for all athletes. I mean, you could make an argument for all cyclists. Um, all cyclists are all athletes. It'd be kind of one of those two. So it's a sample, right? So let me, let me do the sample part first because sample's easier. The sample was the 16, uh, I believe they were high performance cyclists. Oh, highly trained, right there. So there were 16 highly trained cyclists. That's the sample, right? So we could say, so 16 highly trained cyclists. So this is not me, <laughs> you know, the occasional cyclist. This is, you know, highly trained cyclists. These are people that really know what they're doing. They probably wear all that gear and the helmets and the, the weird bicycle clothes that I know are really important for cyclists, but I don't know why, that kind of thing. All right, so what was the population then? Well, the population could be made um, all cyclists, maybe? Or perhaps all athletes? Something like that. I imagine the beverage company would like all athletes because they'd like to sell their beverages to everybody. <laughs> so I'd put that in there. Now, the treatments were the three different um, drinks. So there was the caffeinated sports drink. See if I can spell caffeinated right. I think I did. The non-caffeinated sports drink. Oh my goodness. And the flavored water. I'm just going to put H2O in there. And that's the placebo right here. So the flavored water placebo. The response variable was the total work. The total work in the last five minutes. Um, total work output. Oh, it was last 15 minutes, right? Last 15 minutes. It was measured in kilojoules. 